Hi, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Steve Johnson, Chief Investment Officer here at Forager Funds. Almost forgot who I was, just to kick things off. Uh, this is one of our regular webinars today for the Forager Australian Shares Fund. Just before we kick things off, uh, this is general advice only. Uh, we do not take anyone's personal circumstances into account, and you should seek professional advice where necessary. We're going to talk about uh, the recent reporting season that we've had across the Australian market, some uh, key themes uh, across our portfolio and the wider market out there as well. And I'm joined to do that by the two senior analysts on our Australian Shares Fund, Gaston Amoros on the far side and Alex Shevelev sitting next to me. Thanks for coming, gents, and thank you for coming, gents, and welcome. Hi, Steve. Hi, everyone. Hi, Steve. Thanks. Uh, before we get to the details, I just wanted to do a quick run through of the fund for people that are newer to Forager. Uh, our objective here is to outperform the All Ordinaries Accumulation Index over a long period of time. We have a very flexible mandate. We typically own 20 to 40 stocks. They can be any market cap uh, range and across any sector on the ASX. And it's our intention to use that flexibility to invest in the most prospective parts of the market. Uh, we target a distribution of approximately 4% paid semi-annually, and we have a very diverse group of investors in this fund, which is important to us and our long-term philosophy. Like I touched on, our aim is to outperform the All Ordinaries Accumulation Index. We are not trying to do that on a monthly, quarterly, or even annual basis, though. We are trying to buy businesses that are going to give us better than average returns over longer periods of time. Historically, equity markets have returned somewhere in the range of 8 to 10% per annum here in Australia, and we use that as a benchmark for investing in stocks. Uh, I've added this bottom piece to, to some of our slides recently, and it's been really well received by people in terms of explaining why and how we invest in different parts of the market. We're always trying to beat that 8 to 10% per annum hurdle. Uh, but we're trying to do it in different types of businesses and the magnitude by which we want to beat that hurdle rate return can vary depending on the type of business that we're investing in. At one end of the spectrum there, you can see predictable, large, established businesses where we could be demanding something like a 12% return per annum. Down to the other end of the spectrum where we might invest in riskier, smaller businesses with less of a track record and our hurdle or threshold rate of return there is 20% per annum. It doesn't always come out the way that we want it to, but it's a good framework for thinking about how we think about different types of businesses and what returns we need to invest in them. And we've put a few examples at the bottom of this slide. Seven Group, for example, which is a, an investment in the fund at the moment. It's a large diversified conglomerate that invests in some quite high quality uh, or owns some quite high quality businesses around Australia with a very long track record. It's in that 12% per annum bucket in terms of the sorts of returns that we expect uh, from owning it, down to at the other end of the spectrum, a big tin can, which is a much shorter history. It's a business that's currently unprofitable and we're expecting it to become profitable, but there is a lot of uncertainty around that. So we demand much higher returns for investing in a business like big tin can, and then I think importantly, in the middle part of the spectrum there, we've put Tourism Holdings in as an example. This was a company that was probably further to the right uh, a couple of years ago, but where as things are going better, it has moved in terms of its risk profile towards the left of this spectrum. That's because it is now bigger and more liquid after its merger, merger with Apollo, and the results that we are seeing from the company are really proving up our expectations around its long-term profitability. We will talk about that stock later in the, the presentation, but I think a good example of a, a stock that's currently somewhere in the middle there and still has the potential to keep moving towards the left-hand side of that spectrum. Okay, so that's a quick run through for people that are newer to the fund. We'll jump on to uh, recent fund performance and then get into some of the details. Alex, this is at the end of February, but some decent progress here financial year to date. Well, that's right, Steve. In the financial year to date, can see here that the fund has outperformed the uh, All Ordinaries Accumulation Index by about 4%. Uh, the three-year number is looking uh, healthier as well, 1.6% above. Now, it's worth pausing here and just saying the smaller uh, stocks 
in the market alongside the non-resources stocks in the market, that is the smaller industrials companies, have actually performed quite poorly over those last three odd years. They've only increased by about one percentage point per year. And the last point to make here is just on the since inception number. Since October 2009, uh, this fund has delivered 1.2 percentage points of alpha. Yeah, I think you can see from the, the one of the earlier slides that I put in that our expectations are to do better over that time. And we've really, you can see in the five-year number there and longer-term investors will remember that 2018 and 2019 years where we had some investor investments go spectacularly wrong. And a lot of what you see in the front bit of this presentation has been the work we've done on improving the diversity and liquidity of the portfolio. We have a long way to go here and we need five and 10 years of good performance ahead of us now. But I think there are some encouraging signs in the portfolio. And again, like the early years of the fund, a lot of takeovers coming through over the past uh, financial year and some investments like tourism holdings really showing the or living up to the expectations that we had when we made that investment. Okay, let's jump on to the reporting season that we've just been through. The vast majority of the portfolio reported either half year or full year results to the end of December. Gaston, what were some of the key things that you saw out there, both in our portfolio and the wider market? Well, I think uh, maybe hitting first on the topic of wage inflation, we have seen companies struggling with a very tight uh, labor market. And what that means is they're having difficulty filling in open positions. They're having to pay more to retain staff. Uh, and clearly this doesn't affect everyone the same. There are companies out there that have a high degree of pricing power, but there are also some sectors that uh, have uh, they don't have the same level of pricing power, maybe like healthcare services, because we have one big a buyer like Medicare, which is, you know, could be half half of your revenue, and you don't have the same level of pricing power vis-a-vis -vis that guy. And we'll talk about uh, later about IEX, which is one of the companies in the portfolio. The other uh, topic to call out is uh, we notice uh, a waning, a more on the consumer side, a waning appetite for big ticket items, uh, whether it's uh, housing or vehicles, or furniture or appliances. Companies like uh, Nick Scali, JB Hi-Fi, Harvey Norman, among others, have been uh, prompt to, to notice some uh, slowing down in, in terms of the outlook going forward. Uh, and we think it comes as no surprise uh, amidst uh, high cost of living increases um, in higher interest rates and after two or three years of uh, very high consumption. Yeah, and it probably relates. You touched, Alex, on smaller companies performing dramatically worse than larger over the past few years. It's often the case that they find it more difficult to, to pass on uh, the price rises and the cost issues than the larger, more monopoly-like businesses. What else were you seeing uh, from the management teams and companies that you looked at over February? One of the interesting features in February was the continuation of this higher inventory supply chain questions that companies are having to field. So a lot of the pressure was really evident in the prior reporting period, uh, but it's not as if those problems have gone away completely. So they have partially eased and some of the pricing there has eased, but a lot of the management teams are still quite cautious about keeping enough inventory on hand. So even from the larger players like the Harvey Normans and JB Hi-Fi's, we saw that. And on the smaller side of things with a motorcycle holdings or a Paragon Care, just holding a little bit of excess stock to give them buffer just in case things deteriorate from a supply chain perspective. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see how those inventory balances uh, unwind. It's been an incredibly difficult three-year period for almost all businesses not being able to get enough inventory, then the cost of it very high in terms of shipping, and then maybe some overstocking in terms of well, we need capacity here to deliver on demand and we're going to be a bit more conservative. And now the demand seems to be slowing down quite a bit that they may look back and say, we wish we hadn't bought all of that inventory given the environment that we're looking at. Now, as Gaston touched on, lots of companies reporting like for likes in January and February where they're saying sales are down in those months in an environment where inflation's rampant. That's a recipe for, for crunched margins. Uh, anything else at your end? That's right. And the other thing, and it's a pretty simple point to make, you we do have higher interest rates and we have actually seen that now come through in one of the first six month periods for quite a while of more significant interest costs to the companies that are actually more highly levered. And it'll continue to be a feature into the second half of FY23 and onwards. Yeah, there's so many moving parts and I, 
I feel like the last year that we had any sort of good line of sight where there, there weren't all of these offsetting factors going on was 2019. And you know, we're now looking at 23. And it looks like 2024 is also going to be a year where you're going to have to say, well, there are good reasons why companies are not performing as well as they should be. And I'm trying to establish the sustainable level of earnings for these businesses, I think, is as difficult as it has ever been because we've had COVID and we've had supply chain issues and now we've got inflation. And I think you now even need to look back at that 10-year period leading up to 2019 and say, well, which of these businesses were only looking as good as they were because inflation was really low? Is this a different environment to think about? So huge amount of questions out, out there in terms of uh, what profitability for a lot of these businesses is going to look like in future. And I think that was a pretty consistent theme through reporting season. Uh, let's jump into some of the stocks that are particularly important for our portfolio. And we've picked a few here that are large investments for us and also emblematic, I think, of some of the themes that you've been talking about. We'll kick off with one where things are going very well, and that's tourism holdings, Alex. That's right. So this is a business in recreational vehicles. It has been a great environment to be a recreational vehicle operator in the summer we've just had. Very high yields, that is high day rates to rent a recreational vehicle. You may have actually had this experience where uh, those rates are a lot higher than you would have expected pre-COVID. Um, and a lot of that is to do with fleet constraints at the individual, um, at the actual country level. There is just not enough of these vehicles out there for the demand that's now flowing through. And alongside the merger of competitors that we've seen, THL and Apollo have come together uh, over the last uh, couple of months. Now, the result itself was actually pleasing in that it showed the combined entity uh, and the guidance that management expect of this business into the 2023 financial year. We had the individual businesses provide guidance prior, but this was actually a significant improvement on that, even when adjusted for a couple of puts and takes. The other element here is synergy targets between the two businesses, and they are significant in the 27 to 31 million range. It feels from uh, management's tone in the presentation that that is well on the way, and there might well be some upside with that across the North American businesses that were not part of those initial estimates. Yeah, I'm going to be really interested to see how the the competitive uh, position that they now have shapes out here over the next 10 years as well. It's not something you're ever going to talk about when you're trying to put a merger together because the competition authorities will be all over it. But this business is now in a very dominant position here in Australia and New Zealand. And I think it's the type of business where those network effects are quite important. The more volume you have, the better for customers. They can drop it off in more locations. Lots of reasons why I think that should translate to some increase in the long-term return on capital here for this business. I guess the one thing that would help uh, tourism holdings is a recovery in airline capacity and a lot more international tourists coming in to Australia. That would also help Experience Co, which is another investment in the portfolio. There was a pretty good half year result and one that's likely a bit behind tourism holdings, but really starting to accelerate now as international arrivals come in. Business that's been absurdly profitable and done very well for us as an investment is Qantas over the past 12 months. Uh, it's one where an increase in capacity might not be a good thing. Yeah, that's right. So Qantas is another stock we currently own in the portfolio. They had a very, very strong uh, first half of 23, record level of profits, uh, record level of cash flow. And we've been taking some money off the table on this one as the stock uh, grinds uh, closer to our fair value. I mean, it's fair to say it has a lot of volatility, so uh, it has you know, some big days. But it's getting closer to our fair value, and uh, um, well, it might look cheap on uh, at five times FY23 earnings. We also need to be cognizant that uh, the conditions for Qantas are quite benign in uh, in in this year. And that's an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> that are spectacularly good, and uh, that won't last forever, right? So, an airline so uh, they remain. Um, a mature industry, which is highly cyclical. So um, we'll keep a close eye on that. And But, you know, for now, the going is going incredibly good. Yeah, part of our theory here is that there were some structural improvements that were made through COVID that might make this a more profitable business long term, particularly its domestic operations, which have very, very dominant market share. But the, the macro here and the general industry trends are going to make that very difficult to see for some period of time as well. It's almost mm -hmm. certain that certainly by the time we get out to 25, 26, it's not going to be as profitable as it is at the moment. And 
probably some working capital unwind as well. One of the extraordinary things here has been the this is an airline that if you look at its balance sheet has negative tangible capital. They they fund most of the cost of their mm-hmm. airplanes through working capital and and debt, and there's no tangible capital in it. So it's going to be interesting to see that dynamic unfold as well. But we've done a fair bit of selling there and are likely to exit as it as it meets and exceeds that fair value uh, target. Alex, back to you. Another stock that's well, this stock's been in the portfolio, one of the longer held. Uh, holdings that we have now, and it's a business that has done well both operationally and in terms of share price over the past five years. But you can see on this chart, RPM Global uh, has seen share price off a bit over the past three to six months. We've had a general tech sell off, but was there anything in this latest result that was cause for concern? I think a bit of background on RPM. First, like this transition that the business has made between perpetual and subscription has been working well over the last couple of years. They had invested in their product and in the sales team over that period, so operating costs were reasonably high. When we got to August, the management team gave us guidance for the 23 uh, financial year, and that guidance had a very high level of operating leverage coming through in the business for the first time in years. Now, in the first half FY23, the result we just saw, management confirmed that guidance despite having the headwinds of not being able to find the staff that they needed for the advisory and the consulting businesses, both of those reasonably low margin and less interesting than the very high quality sticky revenue that comes off of the subscription services. Now, in the first half of the year, the business added a bit more than $3 million of recurring uh, ARR, that is run rate revenue in the into the subscription software business. That is, according to management's uh, commentary in the second half, hopefully will improve. There are some large contracts and you would expect them to be there given that the business has spent a lot of money rebuilding these products into best of breed solutions for the large miners out there. Yeah, I think that operational um, leverage that you talk about there, I think you you mentioned to me something like it's getting close to 100% this financial year of the increase in revenue is going to drop through to an increase in cash flow for the business. And it won't be 100%, but we're expecting that to remain very high here for a number of years here as the revenue continues to grow while the cost base stays relatively flat. Uh I'd say in general, we want to see that across particularly some of the unprofitable tech stocks that we own where we're not yet seeing that operational leverage. There's a lot of talk about it. There's a lot of talk about back half of this year is we're going to show you that we have that sort of operational leverage. But in too many companies, I'd say we're we're yet to see it and we want to see that evidence over the coming 12 months. And we also want to see RPM deliver on the commentary around there, there is lots of revenue to come here. Talking of second half, uh, importance, Gaston, another large investment in the portfolio. You touched on it earlier in terms of cost issues, but integral diagnostics. Yeah, so it's one of the largest uh, di- diagnostic imaging providers in Australia. And uh, if you look at the share price, it's been hit uh, of late uh, due to transient concerns about revenue growth and, and profit margins. And if uh, what we got in terms of the first half of 23 showed us a really nice progression in terms of uh, revenue, so they did plus two in Q1 plus six in Q2 and up double digits at the start of, uh, of Q3. Uh, so you know, that was good. It's a gradual recovery in the revenue line. What wasn't so good is uh, the uh, wage inflation that we talked about before that, ha- that has been pretty consistent throughout the half, uh, growing at uh, high single digits. And that drove uh, a deterioration in the EBITDA margin for the first half of 23 versus the second half of 22 to the tune of 150 basis points of EBITDA or, or thereabouts. And with regards to that, what will be very, a very important catalyst for the stock will be the announcement of uh, um, the Medicaid indexation that will be announced for FY24 that will be announced in, in May of this year. Last year, they got 1.6%, which uh, when you think about inflation running between 7 and 8, so it's ludicrous. Uh, but uh, we, um, we hope that, that the new number will start narrowing the gap uh, together with a better revenue trajectory and that will... Uh, you know, show a trajectory of improving margins from this point onwards. I saw the Australian Medical Association in the paper this week doing a lot of lobbying and screaming about this upcoming indexation because it's it's applied across a whole Affects uh, piece wide well. wave, yeah, exactly. of the, the medical sector. So it's going to be really interesting to see that come through. And a, another one where I think this next six to 12 months, you know, 
no investment cases made or lost on a period that that short but we really need this business to recover to those historical margins that's the opportunity here i think that the revenue growth is as as reliable as as mm -hmm. any business that you're going to find out there it's the margin side of things that we need to work and you're going to have a much better feel for that in 12 months time than you have today correct and, it's, and as you said it's very emblematic of the whole sector it's not just uh, idx i mean the whole medical healthcare services is affected by the same dynamics right you have one buyer which is accounts for somewhere between uh, 30 to 50 percent of your volumes medicare so the price that that buyer pays is quite important yeah so we've touched a bit about the the future there and the importance of the coming year but let's move on to the outlook for for the fund and for the market in general uh gaston you and i recorded a video back in january it's on our youtube channel if anyone wants to go back and watch it but just talking about this coming tsunami of fixed rate mortgage expiries uh, and this chart sums it up pretty well I just thought I'd put it up again today and let you talk a little bit uh, to why we're seeing this weak consumer environment and I guess what the, the outlook is for that over the coming year. Well I mean if you look at that chart on slide 15 it's a monthly chart and uh, what it shows you is the amount of uh, of uh, um, sorry, the percentage of uh, fixed mortgages in Australia that come up for either refinancing or they flip into from fixed to variable month by month. And what you can see is that uh, in 2023, 55% of the stock of fixed mortgages in Australia are you know, due for refinancing. And then you get another 20% in, uh, in, uh, in 2024. Um, and that the average more uh, fixed mortgage is paying currently is paying slightly over two percent for those mortgages that are expiring, and those rates will have to be refinanced at somewhere between five and six percent if you believe current pricing. And while a three to four percent increase doesn't sound like much in abstract when you apply it to the astronomical values of uh, Australian uh, um, housing, particularly in uh, places like Sydney and Melbourne, that's a vast amount of money that uh, families will have to save elsewhere to pay to the bank. And clearly that doesn't bode well for consumer discretionary stocks. Uh, we alluded to some of those uh, before. Um, from our side, you know, we, we when we look at the, those share prices or the, the estimates for that, that sector, we don't see uh, yet uh, fully priced the, the extent and the probability of that uh, headwind. So that's why, you know, we, we've remained, we've chosen to remain patient. Yeah, it is very, very clearly going to be a, a difficult, perhaps extremely difficult uh, year for some segments of the Australian consumer. I had someone on Twitter saying to me, you know, you guys are not macro forecasters. Why are you even worrying about this stuff? Just buy cheap stocks and don't worry about it. And, and I think that is a, a fair comment. We've actually bought some stocks in our international portfolio that are exposed to the cyclical housing sector where that is very clearly going to slow down dramatically in 2023 but where we thought we were paying a price that well and truly compensated us for that and then the long-term earnings capacity of the business i think what you're saying here is not we're trying to time the macro here but that we're just not seeing share prices that reflect any sort of uh distress about the the long-term earnings capacity of these businesses and i i still think there's actually a bit too much um extrapolation of COVID related mm -hmm. margins. I think it's sales. And then as people try and maintain their sales levels, businesses like JB Hi-Fi that you touched on earlier, it's a world-class business and we would love to own it at the right price. But it seems like the sort of environment where we can get a lot more pessimism about these businesses than we're, we're seeing at the moment. Leads me on to a bit of current portfolio positioning. I just wanted to put this slide in. We've been talking a lot over the past few years about some small illiquid investments. Long-term investors in the fund would remember some of the things that went wrong in 2018 and 2019 and us talking a lot about what we have learned from that. You can see here that percentage of the portfolio that's less than 200 million in market cap has gone down from 44% to about 21%, 44% in 21, 21% today. And a lot of that, Alex, is some small illiquid problematic investments for us that have been cleaned up some of them like msl uh with a very successful outcome and others us just moving on that's right so more generally across the portfolio the liquidity has improved as some of those sub 200 uh, mil illiquid stocks have come out and been replaced by more to larger businesses maybe 200 to a billion in market cap or thereabouts um now, one of the aspects here, as you mentioned it on you, in the first couple of slides, that spectrum of returns where illiquidity uh, definitely requires a much higher return. 
And that for the time being has kept us away from some of those very uh, illiquid businesses. Yeah, and that's not to say we won't do it. We will be doing it uh, at the right price. It's just being patient and making sure that we are getting compensated for the illiquidity. And often potentially illiquidity, you can look at a stock that is going through difficulties or troubles and look at its historical traded volume and that not be representative at all of what's going to happen in future as, as the business becomes smaller and goes through difficult times. So uh, we are being really patient here, and I think we're in an environment where there can be plenty of opportunities in that sub-200 million uh, market cap for us to add to the portfolio. This is a slide that shows the split by sector uh, at the moment, and I'd say generally a fairly diverse spread of sectors here, but a couple of things uh, worth talking about for sure is the the exposure there to information technology being about a third. There is a mix of stocks in that, that piece of the pie. I think it's important to note that in that circa 31%, there is about 17% which are more mature, profitable technology businesses uh, that uh, are very good at weathering the sort of risks that we've spoken about over the last couple of minutes, alongside some unprofitable but faster growing uh, businesses as well. Worth noting the cash position there, 11 at the uh, beginning, uh, at the end of February, and now a little bit higher. We still have Nitro that is under uh, takeover at the moment, which is another couple of hundred basis points we believe will become cash. And um, the other element there is the consumer discretionary bucket. Given what we've just spoke about, spoken about, 16% seems like a reasonably high number, but 11% of that is actually tourism. And with THL and Experience Co. Qantas as examples, these businesses are sort of running to their own beat. And Gaston, also in the portfolio, I do we have been working hard to try and uh, focus on those more resilient businesses. And healthcare is a, a sector where... Uh, we talk about the cost, but the revenue line should be very reliable. It is definitely more offensive. And if you look at that number up on the screen of uh, 10%, that's made up of uh, three businesses, which are very diverse. So IDX that we touched on is just one of them. We have another two. They are very diverse, exposed to different uh, dynamics, but uh, yes, absolutely offensive. Great. I, I think the general message out of all of that, if you add all of those things up that you talked about on the cash front, I think sort of 13% as we sit here today, another three and a bit percent from Nitro, 16% cash or so in the portfolio. And we want to do a much, much uh, better job through cycles of being more patient with that cash allocation and making sure that the liquidity of the portfolio allows us to do that. You can see from previous drawdowns that the recovery of the fund has been very significant in the subsequent years after it. June 2019, March of 2020 being particularly significant. You know, we're up. 18% or so financial year to date here, but lots of really interesting stocks and it's still, I think, very interesting valuations. And you know, if the past two weeks is anything to go by, it's still a lot of skittishness out there amongst investors. And I think the type of environment with so much uncertainty about the consumer where we are going to see opportunities to deploy that capital at highly attractive rates of return. Alex, I'm sure we'll get the question in the Q&A, so we'll, we'll uh, address it now. But the discount that the units have been trading at on the ASX, you can see on this chart sort of oscillated between minus 5 and minus 15% over the past couple of years. Uh, what, what have we been doing on that front? That's right, Steve. So uh, buyback has been front and centre here. It's about 3.8% of the units on issue this financial year so far. And that's been bought back at about a 9% discount rate. Now, we talked about more um, clarity around the distribution policy of the fund. And to that end, a distribution of three cents was paid in January for the prior six months. And the expectation is for another three cents in uh, July for the six months to June. And then potentially a special distribution there if there is a lot of taxable income in the entity. Yeah, and it is worth reminding people we are targeting a 4% yield from this vehicle and lots of investors appreciate that, that income component of it. But this is largely a capital returns vehicle and the long-term returns and distributions from the fund are going to be largely dependent on the stocks that we own going up in share price rather than it being a, a particular dividend vehicle. So look, I actually think there's been some, some progress here. If you look at the average there over the past year, uh, 
apart from a, a short period, it's been closer to that 5% range, but it is something that we continue to, to work on and continue to consider uh, what we can do better in the future. Okay, we will move on to the Q&A now. So we'll just take a moment to pause and collate some questions, but there's a Q&A uh, box on your screen that you can just uh, click on and type your questions in, and we'll pick the most representative of those and jump to them. All right, we might start with the first question on this list from Sam McDonald. What is the turnover ratio on the Australian international funds? Is there a target? How do you take into account balancing fund returns versus post-tax returns and compounding for clients? I think that's a really good question, and it has been highly, highly variable over the past few years. And Alex, maybe you can touch on why that has been the case, and I'd say why people probably should expect it to be the case. Hmm. I mean, I, I think our turnover largely uh, is a response to the environment we see, the opportunities that both present themselves to exit positions that are either underperforming or whether they have outperformed our expectations and narrowed the future returns we expect alongside what happens with new ideas and what potential future returns they generate. So it's a short way of saying it is dependent on the environment and the sort of stocks we find. Yeah, and I'd say the more volatile markets are you have a big bull market you should expect a lot of turnover uh, from us and you know through markets where not a lot happens you probably expect it to be more stable i would say about a third is a good middle of the range amount of portfolio turnover made up of two things stocks that are working out for us and really importantly and something we have been doing a much better job of moving on from stocks where the investment thesis is not playing out we own Downer in this portfolio. It was a disappointing investment to start with, but I think our recognition there when the first couple of downgrades came out that this business was not doing what we expected it to do and moving on has saved us a lot of money given what's happened there subsequently. And I think for anyone, uh, us included, that recognising early the things that are not working and you're getting wrong is a really important part of your portfolio turnover as well. Yeah, think about it as roughly a third. I've become, as I've got older, more and more adamant about managing portfolio exposures really closely. You know, you, you make a great investment, the share price runs up, it becomes 15 or 20% of your portfolio. It's very easy to fall in love with those stocks. And for every case of something that you, you look back and say, oh, it just kept growing and I never should have sold it, there's also something that subsequently falls by half and three quarters. So we do constantly try and get that portfolio waiting right, given what's in front of us today. And that may lead to a little bit more turnover and a little bit more taxable income than otherwise would have been the case, but hopefully better risk mitigation as well. Uh, I'm here, this is Yongyi Li. I'm curious to hear your assessment on whether the recent Silicon Valley bank collapse will impact on any Aussie or international portfolio stocks. For instance, I saw in a recent ABT news article that Nitro has about 12 million of the company's global cash reserves held on deposit at SVB. I mean, we can touch on the specifics quickly from either of you. It should be pretty straightforward. Well, I mean, it's, um, it's <laughs> I think the tender is very close to coming to, to fruition uh, for Nitro. So um, they... Very, I would assume that it's a very low risk from that point of view. Uh, but then also, all the deposits uh, at the SBB, my understanding is all the depositors will be on or so that uh, becomes a, a non non factor. Right? Yeah. By and large, across the the mostly tech businesses that we hold, um, and that we saw out there, there have been smaller exposures to uh, to SVB. And in any case, now that we've seen the um, the response to that it looks like those uh, deposits will be honoured. Yeah, I, I think that issue is likely to be a non-event for most ASX listed companies. I would take one important uh, insight out of what has happened over there, and that is that a lot of really stupid shit happens when interest rates are 0%. <laughs> yeah, it, I, it blows my mind what's actually happened here, that they they took a whole heap of deposits and invested it in 10-year mortgage-backed securities that were yielding 1.6%. That was what the bank did with the assets because short-term investments were yielding 0 half a percent, whatever it was, and they wanted the one6 So I think we're going to see that that period of really low interest rates, money being thrown at businesses all over the place, people reaching for yield. 
there are going to be a long list of, I think, consequences that come from that that mm. we're going to see. This is one example that I think in isolation is not itself a big issue for ASX listed companies, but it is worth, I think, being co um, cognizant of the fact that it was a proper liquidity bubble over the past few years and that that has uh, costs and, and implications long term. You'll like this one, Gaston. Whisper has been a disappointing investment for the fund. Uh, do you have an update? Do you think they will need a capital raise? So on the capital raise, uh, um, look, uh, I don't think they need a capital raise. Uh, they restructure the pretty aggressively towards the end of last year. They basically got rid of one third of the company. And uh, shortly after that, they shut down the US uh, entity as subsidiary. Uh, as a result of that, they saved an incremental $4 million of uh, spend. So the company should be cash flow positive or break even from it was cash flow break even in December of last year, and it should be cash flow positive or break even from Q4 of uh, this financial year. Um, now, what we need to see from all these companies, it's great that they they cut they cut the cost line, and this applies to a lot of uh, the companies in this segment. Uh, now, what we need to see is some consistency in terms of delivering revenue growth, even if it's not like 20 or 30 percent, but just deliver some some uh, uh, good level of uh, some sound level of revenue growth. And, and as you guys were saying before, letting some of that incremental revenue drop down to uh, the profit and the cash flow line. Um, and, uh, and I think, however, which is one thing that we need to keep in mind with all these companies is that they are, this, they are secular growers, uh, they are tech companies, but we should remember that tech is, uh, is cyclical by definition and therefore over if you get a really soft economic environment and it looks like we're going that way it will be tricky to disentangle what's secular from what's cyclical for for many of these companies uh, and i think you've seen overnight uh, every day we see companies in the us uh disappoint in terms of outlook so uh clearly some of this is happening uh for for whisper and for comps of whisper like twilio and, and others so um but to your question about the balance sheet after doing such a heavy restructuring, uh, I uh, I don't think they have a balance sheet issue. Yeah, and look, the liquidity has completely and utterly evaporated in that investment and a, a couple of other things that we hold in, in the space. So it's not trading on big volumes, but the market cap is down to what I would call an absurdly low level there. And I actually think most of these businesses, yes, we've seen a round of cost cuttings. You know, Meta's up to round three now. And I think to the extent that you're... Uh, worries about the environment come true. I still think there's a huge amount of optional cost in these businesses that that can come out if they need them to come out. And we have made it very, very, very clear with this business that they need to live within their means, and we're expecting to see that in the the cash flow statements over the next two quarters. Gradual progression from this March one through to the June one, but by June we want to see positive cash flow. And if the environment gets worse, then they need to make the cost base get less as well. Great. I would just add to that that it's a pocket, it's a segment of the market that uh, has uh, has where investors have lost all appetite uh, due to a, a um, you could call it risk aversion. Nobody wants to go there, so there's a complete apathy and lack of interest in the space from the on the side of the institutional investors. Uh, and I would just uh, I would just venture to say that on the retail side, they look at the share price and they don't want to touch it either. So, um, you know, the, the companies need to execute, they need to deliver, and in a better market environment, you'll see that translate to like better trading from a share uh, point of view. Yeah, I put Big Tin Can in very similar boat. There's a couple of questions here about it, but one specific around one around bizarre management and board level execution. I mean, we we'll probably have some aligned thoughts with that question around what's been going on there over the past six months. I think encouragingly on this side, the, the revenue line is going quite nicely. The revenue line is, uh, is holding, out, uh, uh, holding out well, correct? I mean, uh, I wouldn't say we're big fans of uh, to knocking out a, a somebody dismissing a bid at 80 cents and then like uh, at the same time turning around and and raising capital even if it's not a huge amount uh, to do bolt-on acquisitions that uh, they turn out to be defensive because you need them to sustain the the product road, roadmap so we're not big fans of that um but i mean said that i mean it's a very interesting space they're still growing uh, at a decent pace the turning uh, cash flow break even in Q4 of uh, FY23 this year, if I remember correctly. 
and uh, and and it's a space that uh, we think will consolidate uh, relatively quickly. And they are one of the top uh, four players in the space. So um, there's a lot, I think the, the risk reward on a lot of these stocks looks quite compelling in terms of the upside downside proposition from here. Yeah, we need to manage the portfolio exposures to them uh, carefully because they are early stage businesses. Alex, couple here, uh, there's a question about interest on the cash balance. We were actually talking about this this morning. We are working to optimize that and you should expect us to try and get the maximum interest rate that we can on our cash deposits. Uh, it's not as good as you can get. It's one place where you do much better as a retail investor than an institutional investor. Uh, but we are working on that. And then question here about McMahon, uh, thoughts on that investment, and maybe broaden that into mining services as well. We own Parenti there too. That's right. So both of these businesses, and um, I guess we can focus on McMahon given the question, uh, have seen... Uh, have seen sort of a, a move through COVID and a move closer towards more normalized margins. Now, Parenti is a really good example of this because in their investor deck, you'll actually find a, a reasonably stable progression of margins from where they started to the 10% level that the business is hoping to uh, achieve uh, in uh, about 18 months' time. Uh, McMahon has slightly more complication than that because of the large uh, project that they are doing in Indonesia and continue to do. They rolled over that contract so they will be on site and continuing to achieve EBIT and revenue from that for the foreseeable seven or eight years, which was a good result. Um, but it needs to continue delivering on the operational aspect there to get the re EBIT returns. And it needs to continue to, again, operationally achieve elsewhere and putting a lot of the cost pressures and a lot of the issues that the space has had in its rear view mirror. Yeah, cash back to shareholders here is the, the piece of the puzzle that we're really pushing hard for. Operationally, they're going quite well. And again, it's another sector that I think has got some tailwinds behind it in terms of the resources sector doing well and needing more and more work done. So there's plenty of work out there. They've done a much better job of turning that work into healthy margins. It has been, the growth has consumed a lot of capital over the past few years. The next piece over the next couple of years here is to see the cash that they're going to generate return back to shareholders and not do anything stupid in terms of new contracts, which has been the, the history of the sector. Well, one of the good moves there has actually been towards more of a focus on free cash. So we hope it's a precursor to being actually able to return that capital. Yeah, a few more um, a few more stock specifics that we'll touch on quickly, and then I'll come back to some broader fun ones. Motorcycle holdings, maybe touch on that result quickly. S seems to be going sour. Is the uh, comment from Simon Samuel there? I think that's uh, I think that's right, Samuel. Um, so the last couple of months, specifically November, December of calendar twenty two, uh, is a period where they saw quite a sharp deterioration. Now, interestingly, when you look at the like-for-like like numbers, because they had made an acquisition couple actually in the interim, so the like-for-like like numbers saw gross profit reasonably flat, but an acceleration of costs. So we spoke about the cost pressures, Gaston mentioned it earlier, they've been uh, unfortunately hit by that and have not seen the revenue on the other side. Meanwhile, they have a business that uh, provides wholesale accessories and parts to uh, dealerships and retail stores, that business has seen its gross profit fall somewhat because this environment that we're going into, the retailers are positioning for it and ordering less of the wholesale, uh, less inventory from the wholesaler. Yeah, I'm a bit more optimistic about this business than Chevy's. I think there's some ingredients here. There is no doubt motorbikes are a highly discretionary purchase for people. There is no doubt that the business is going to go through a more difficult period. We have a guy running it who's got a lot of skin in the game. The business that they bought, the two people who sold it took equity in the company and have become involved in the management of it. And that business is actually going really, really well. They make ATVs. Uh, and here in Australia, there were some new regulations brought in a few years ago that the Japanese manufacturers decided not to comply with. Uh, the business is doing they're saying $20 million of EBITDA for the year. So it's going to make more than the core uh, motorcycle holdings dealership business here historically, and it pays out fat dividends. So I, I like being invested alongside this guy, and I'm happy to let him navigate what's going to be a very difficult environment. And hopefully 
Um, maybe some balance sheet repair needs to happen first here, but I still think there is a large consolidation opportunity amongst the dealerships and difficult trading environments is going to make that a lot easier than it was. We had a couple of questions back here that I wanted to uh, uh, maybe touch on the, the fintech stocks. There's a question about Wiser throw plenty into that basket either. That's a pretty interesting space into uh, this environment that we're talking about and modest, um, very modest portfolio weightings for us here. Likely to stay that way, but interesting stocks. Mm. Yeah, so very small position weightings. But the, the concept there was that you have a shift in personal loan and auto lending towards these uh, fintech lenders. When we, of course, did our initial work, the one thing that kills these businesses is bad debts. And one of the things that was uh, pleasant to see at the time and continues to be the case, at least in their backwards looking uh, numbers, is that we are lending in the case of Wiser and Plenty to a higher credit quality uh, cohort. Now, the one big thing, of course, is what bad debts are going to be doing over the next 12 to 18 months. And that's why we have kept those position sizes quite low. If they are truly uh, in a position to uh, make it through this period and continue originating the sort of volumes that they've been originating pre uh, the last six odd months, then these businesses will be thriving. Uh, if bad debts come and uh, throw a significant spanner in the works, then those positions will be in trouble. Yeah, Plenty is probably a better um, credit profile than Wiser, but both of them claim they are lending to high credit customers, this is the first time we're really going to see either business go through a very difficult cycle. So we're going to know one way or the other, and it's one of those situations, and this is why the weightings are low, it's probably either they're worthless or they're going to be worth many, many multiples of today's price. The, the in-between there is, is highly unlikely. Uh, we've had a couple of questions, or maybe summarise one of them. Would you mind going back to your drawdown and recovery slide, given we're only early in any recovery, potentially more pain to come? How do you see the relative value of the fund's investments? Uh, other people saying, should you not be holding more cash into a potential downturn? I think it is important here for some broader context around what you touched on earlier, that it has been a pretty horrible five-year period, really, for industrial companies here in Australia, and lots of them are trading already at very low multiples. And we think there are plenty of opportunities to sift through that and find businesses that we think are going to go perform fairly independently of that consumer cycle here over the next few years. Not all of them, but a large portfolio that we think like that. And you know, I, I think there is plenty of value on offer out there at the moment. And for us, that 16% cash weighting that we're sitting at at the moment is at the higher range of, of where we've been historically. And you know, frankly, I think as, as things get more, have gotten more pessimistic over the past couple of weeks, for me, you should expect to see us deploying some of that cash rather than holding more cash. And that's completely dependent on things getting nice and cheap for us and some great bargains coming up out there. But I'd be pretty balanced in terms of um, the prospects of returns from here. Everything can always go down. You know, we're not sitting here at depths of bear market valuations in terms of the overall market, that's for sure. But we're not sitting here at crazy the high prices either. And I think there are lots of different components to the index where they're going to perform differently through this environment. Do you have any thoughts on that or comments? You're the perma bear, Gaston. Uh, I am a little bit more bearish. Uh, look, I, I just think it's just uh, it's uh, useful to put it in the context of the business cycle. Uh, it's always, it's never super clear where you are in the business cycle, uh, whether we are just, uh, you know, slowing down or we're just at, at the bottom or we're not at the bottom yet. It's just, time will tell. Um, but uh, even, I mean, it doesn't mean that we're all going to die, right? It just, um, I think uh, the point that, that Steve alluded to is, because it's hard to time, uh, the fund has the philosophy of when the value when the price is below the intrinsic value of the stock on a long duration basis, you know, looking out three to five years, that's when you feel confident in starting a position and then you might reserve the prerogative to keep adding to the, that position as long as the long-term value stacks up, right? Yeah. I think well below is probably the thing that I add to that. We are going to be patient here and uh, to the extent that we get some great opportunities, we'll put the money to work and, you know, to the extent that that 
doesn't happen, that things don't deteriorate further from here, then we think we've got a really good portfolio that can perform well over a long period of time too. Uh, okay, we will wrap it up there. It's a pretty busy day out there on the ASX at the moment, talking of uh, market movements and things happening. So we will move on. If we haven't answered your question, we will get uh, back to it via email. Thank you very much for tuning in. And as always, uh, send us an email or get in touch if you have any further questions. Thanks a lot.